quite close to my heart. Um, we have a lot of problems trying to attract, and even when we do attract, to retain um, a gender balance within our group in Ireland. Somebody asked me about a month ago to put some thought into this and think about why. So I've explored this and I want to share with you today my thoughts about it and also um, my own journey through how did I end up in cybersecurity and how I'm looking at some people around me who, who are doing this and some of the problems that I think we're facing as an industry because of the fact that we have such shortages of staff in this area and the fact that we're missing out on half the world um, not applying and not, not joining us for this. So, um, the agenda today is um, cyber and gender, my story, and how can we influence the future. So first of all, um, I put some thought into what do I think are the typical characteristics of a cybersecurity person. They're typically, but not always, a STEM graduate. So they've probably done computer science, engineering, mathematics, that type of field. Um, although in my team, some of the really good people we have are arts graduates actually, who have subsequently found an interest in computer science and have gone on to take up cybersecurity, penetration testing, forensic technology. Um, and what I find is those people are great at writing reports, so they're very welcome uh, in our team. Communication skills are very important. There is no point um, being able to analyze somebody's website, find out what's going wrong in an organization if you can't communicate it in business language. There is definitely room for people who want to sit and do penetration testing and technical things all day long. But as part of a broad team, um, people who can do the technical skills and communicate in business language tend to be the people that are very valuable in the cybersecurity community. People need to be super IT literate. There's no point being very siloed in a, a specific area if you are a web app pen tester or if you're a forensic investigator. You really do need that broad level of skills that you understand hardware, operating systems, application software, the stack and how the whole thing goes together. You need to be smart. You need to be smarter at least than the cyber criminals who you're trying to protect people's systems from. You need to be dedicated to lifelong learning. Um, I think in all sectors, you will see people with 10 years experience who have one year's experience 10 times over, and you'll meet people who have 10 years actual experience doing things. And I think this is such a fast moving area that we have to put the effort into staying on top of our skills. Things change overnight. You have to investigate and read up on a new vulnerability, People want to ask you about it. They want you to help them make sure that they're protected against this vulnerability. So it's not a static area. It's not an area to be in if you are not interested in putting in those extra hours following up on blogs and understanding what's really going on in, in current times. I think also people need to be open to working amongst diverse talent. Um, as I said, you know, typically you're looking at people who are maths and science and there is a, a kind of a geek kind of thing that people have around this area and not everybody in the area is geeky. We do seem to have more than our fair share of geeks, um, but that's okay if people are open to working with each other and that's equally so, you know, people who are a bit geeky need to be able to work with people who aren't and vice versa. So openness to working among diverse talent. And, I said to myself, are, are any of these things uniquely male? Does it, does it characterize male to me if I say any of these things? And, and I don't think they do really. I, I don't think that men have particular acumens or personality traits that fit them into that profile um, more strongly than, than others. So I thought about, well, maybe it's the career path that's the problem. Um, so I kind of analyzed what I thought were typical career paths for people and in a, in a non-technical environment, usually the question is, do you have the skills to do the job? And if you want to progress further, um, can you manage and motivate others to do the job and teach them how to do it? 
And then further again, it's can you reach outside your group and your team and actually explain to other people what you do and promote those skills outside there. So if you flick that into technical language, um, it's again, do you have the skills to do the job? And can you deepen and broaden that technical knowledge and pass it on to other people? And then can you get yourself into a position that you're considered to be a guru? I find a lot of people that I come across day to day um, in this career, they object to managing people or they don't like um, having to liaise with teams outside their own areas. And in a consulting area, that could be with clients, but inside in an organization, it's reaching out to the business and trying to understand their problems and fit the solution to their problems. So a lot of technical people like to work in silos. Um, and that's okay to a certain extent, as long as there are people in the team who have a balance within it. But it seems to put people off at a certain stage, this, this siloing, um, and get people to move out of the area. Um, so again, I say, are these things that are more typically male than female? I don't think so. So going back again, I was thinking, well, is it people just don't want to do cyber and they're happy doing IT? or is it that we're not getting women into IT? And there's a lot of research that's been done about women not working in IT, women dropping out having uh, gone into IT. And we see that there's a lack of women at every stage um, through education all the way up to employment. And I gathered some statistics which I think back this up. Um, some of them are from the UK and some of them are from Ireland. Uh, in the UK, um, the, the not the final school exams, but the, the one before that, um, the GCSE, 51% uh, of all GCSEs are taken by females, and 44% of the IT ones are taken by females. But when you put that into their leaving cycle, doing their A-levels, only 6.5% of females are doing A-levels in IT, which would suggest that there is a interest in it at the earlier stages, but that as time goes on, and people are taking a view to what they might do in university, something is changing at about that point that people are thinking, well, I, I don't really want to go to college and do computer science as a woman, so only 6.5% are taking it at A level. Women make up 55% of higher education entrants, but only 35% of STEM entrants, and only 13% of computer science entrants. So again, when you're starting to wind it back and saying, how come we have so few women in cybersecurity, it's becoming evident that there's a problem at third level. Um, there are 1.1 million IT specialists in the UK, only 16% of whom are women. Female IT specialists are typically paid 16% less than their male peers. And to compound these figures, um, research was done in uh, 2014 saying that only 11% of information security professionals were female. And sadly, this has actually gone down um, in 2015 when the last trend was, was picked up to 10%. So this is really poor. So I thought, right, well, go back again and let's look into the education and let's focus on the different areas. So I have two daughters, well, I have three daughters actually, but two of whom who've gone into third level. And one of them chose engineering. Uh, she went to one of the top five universities in Ireland to study this, and she was the only female in her class of electronic engineers um, graduating in 2012, which doesn't say much really, does it, for our encouragement for females into this area. And one of my daughters chose law, but I don't know where we went wrong there, and I'm hoping she'll become a law technologist at some stage. <laughs> um, there, there have been initiatives by different organizations to try and encourage people in. SANS, a well-known um, organization that does a lot of training for cybersecurity, um, have a special academy for women to try and attract them in in a non-threatening environment. Um, it's free. That they have to go and work in specific organizations that have sponsored them afterwards, but it's still a great initiative. Um, we looked also at computer science entrance in a large college in Ireland going in and we found that in 2015 33% were female which I thought was quite good actually 2014 it was only 26% in first years in the entrance 
but in 2015, the third years were only 14% female. And some of this was to do, I think, with a low intake, but some was also to do with a high dropout rate because the core group isn't strong enough within the discipline for people to stay. Um, some other initiatives that we came across, uh, women in cybersecurity, and just in Ireland, we have a lot of new cybersecurity courses that are starting up, as I think there probably is in all EU countries. And again, they're not really getting their fair share of females attracted into it. So I looked at our um, higher education leaving cert A-level equivalent in Ireland to see could I see any trends um, as to why this might be happening. Um, so the, the green are female and the blue are male. So if you look at this, Subjects like applied maths, um, there's a very strong male bias on this, even in second level education. Uh, maths, interestingly, has a 50-50 bias in it, so there's no suggestion that you know, women aren't picking maths at, at higher level in Ireland. Um, the rest of the science subjects, biology, again, quite a, a strong male bias. Interestingly, chemistry in Ireland has a strong female bias. There is a reason for this because um, pharmacy in Ireland tends to attract a lot of females into it and uh, a lot of them want to do chemistry at second level before they leave school because of that. If you look at engineering and technology, it's off the scale. And then when you look over to some of the other areas like music and home economics, these are very, very bent towards females. So I think there's a question to be asked at the schools, there's a question to be asked of parents there's a question to be asked of career guidance teachers as to why this mix is, because women aren't more musical than men. That's, you know, women aren't better at cooking and kind of budgeting than men. So, so why is it that this bias is, is there? And that certainly does influence the choices that people make for a third level and then ultimately for, for the role they play later on. So I thought, right, the problem seems to be happening earlier than this, so I thought I'd go back and look and see what the trends are around primary and secondary level education. And I would say, I, I have two sons as well, and I was looking at them and what they do around technology. So they are very into gaming, and this seems to be quite a male thing, because I have three girls as well, and they're not into gaming. And I, I do feel some of this is probably around the game designs, and there has been research done around the games that are designed by men, for men, that all the people who are working in this area, the majority of them are men, so the games they make are going to appeal to men, and this is an ongoing um, circle. Um, phone culture, which is technology-based, is very gender-neutral. Gender um, as many young girls in, in primary and secondary school have phones as guys, and you know they're texting, they're doing all the things, WhatsApp, they're doing all the things that the guys are doing, so there doesn't appear to be a difference here. Um, in Ireland, we have no formal IT education in primary and secondary schools, which is a shame, um, and it's something that our education boards are trying to fix. A lot of schools do do it, but it's on an ad hoc basis. We do have some great uh, private initiatives, where, and they're, they're somewhat international. I'm sure you've probably come across them, like Coder Dojo. Um, my own kids have attended there, and I look at it, and the gender bias there is very good. Um, they seem to be doing a really good job of attracting a mixed group into them. We also have a, a coding academy down the road to me, and I spoke to the people there and said, what's your gender bias like, and you know, have you done anything to change it? And they told me that they were only attracting in 16% females into their courses that they were running, and that somebody said to them, you need to do more about your website. All the pictures about your courses on the website are all guys. So they actually changed and split the gender balance on the pictures on their website, trying to attract people in. And they've moved up to 23% females. So I thought that was very interesting that young girls had obviously been looking at their website and going, oh, I don't think I want to go there. You know, it seems to be all boys. But they've, they've changed that. And that was only a very recent change. So I think that's going to turn around and actually um, move for them. There is a negative perception on security. I don't think this necessarily impacts females more than males, but, but certainly it is viewed as something that stops people doing things by a large population. It's an annoyance. It's, oh, I couldn't install my application because they said no. So that, that does seem to have an influence. Um, and also I asked my second level daughter, as she's considering her career options for the future, what her friends thought of going into cybersecurity, and these are some of the answers they gave back. Um, 
some of them were saying, no, I can't believe that Miss X, one of their teachers, did computer science because she's quite cool. No, it's all boys. I'm good at maths, but I want to do business. I like science, but I want to do medicine. And one of them went, no, I know your mum does that. No offence, but they're all a bit weird, aren't they? So, <laughs> like, that's, that's the perception that's out there. Some, some degree, I think, among males, but certainly among young females, second level education in Europe, it appears to be what, what they think. I decided that I would have a look in my firm at gender balance um, across the different grades. My, my organization has made a lot of effort to try and redress um, gender balance issues that they have, and they've been doing this with a very focused effort for about 10 years. So firm-wide, you'll see as we're taking people in, there's a 50-50 gender balance. And they, they sustain this fairly well up until about the senior manager level. And at director level and partner level, it seems to drop off. Some of this is related to typical career path for a woman, I think, and that they um, take time out, take a career break at that time in their lives. Um, but clearly, there's an alignment that maybe 10, 15 years down the line uh, that the firm put their focus on gender balance at this stage, and so it takes a while for it to actually roll through. But this is firm-wide in an organization where we're not just doing cybersecurity and technology, we're also doing things like accountancy and uh, general consulting, which is something that is more traditionally female. But when we flip over into consulting in my organization, uh, you'll see that there's a significant difference. Um, we can't, even though we're trying to attract in a gender balance on the way in, we can't. There just aren't the candidates to attract in. So we're only getting 35 and 65 going through. And this goes all the way up. There's a, const there's a consistent um, emphasis on this right the way up to senior manager level. But again, when it comes to directors and partners, there's a sharp drop off. Like you can see, we actually have 0% female partners in this area, which is sad. And actually in cybersecurity in my organization, um, we're actually 100% male at manager and senior consultant level. We have no women. And given that I lead the practice in this area, it's not for want of trying to bring people in. They're just, we're not getting the applicants or those that we do get maybe aren't suited to the role or they're not ready at their time in their life. So we get, we get very few applicants in. So there's been a lot of research around uh, gender balance in the workplace and the positive effects that this have. Um, men and women often have very different viewpoints, ideas, market insights, and this generally um, has, gives better problem solving and ultimately um, leads to better performance at business level. A, a gender diverse work source, or workforce also allows a company to serve um, the diverse customer base they have as well. And this might not just be in the client kind of relationship that we have, but also internally within their organization. Um, you always have somebody who you're delivering your work to. So there is some customer, some consumer of what you're, you're creating. And um, gender diversity also helps companies to attract and retain talented women. Companies can't afford to ignore 50% of the potential workforce um, and expect to be competitive in the global economy. And in fact, there's a, there's a further thing to this, which I, I tried to put into some kind of a formula and I couldn't quite get it right in my mind, but if you're missing out by having 10% only of women, 40% of the men you have are probably not the right candidates for the role either. Like 50% of them are probably right, but 40% of them could well be replaced by 50% of women who are better qualified or have better uh, acumen for doing it. So there's a there's a, an imbalance both ways. You're missing out on talented women, but you're probably having to reach to a broader pool than you should have of males as well. It's probably not a very popular point. But. Um, so there are some traditional biases in, in gender um, when you look at different roles that people do. And if you, you know, just go through these and say, you know, do, do I think of a, a picture of a man or does a picture of a woman come into my mind? Like when you say military, nurse, builder, pilot, cleaner, painter, teacher. And I think we all get an image of somebody who pops into our mind of a specific gender. They're, they're quite gender role specific. But if you add on to the end of that ethical hacker, SOC engineer, and cyber incident response, again, in your own head, the image tends to come up as a male. 
the, uh, um, and e even for me, who is a female, I'm thinking of my team that I work with, and most of them are, are men. So there aren't enough role models in this space for people to look to. So I just wanted to share a little bit with you about my story and um, how I kind of traveled to where I was and some of the challenges, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here, some of the challenges that, that um, females can, can uh, hit in this area. So um, the reason I got interested in computers was because my dad computerized oil rigs and we traveled all over the world. So computers and computerization and technology was a very normal thing for me and my family, so I wasn't um, pushed against it. Um, I had an Apple II at home when I was a teenager um, and I was able to kind of program and mess on it and learn to use it and that's what kind of introduced me into doing that. I actually started college really, really young and dropped out because it didn't suit me and went on to do a diploma in computer programming. Um, and then I did a lot of education at night, um, doing electronics and uh, various different things. I typically was the only female in the room um, as I went through this journey. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved when the IBM PC was launched and um, I attended in Ireland the first training course on this, but again, I was the only female who attended this course. Um, I worked with computer dealers and uh, installed a lot of systems around in government bodies and uh, I went over to the UK and I managed um, a tech support group for a UK company and I came back to Ireland and I worked for a large American manufacturer. I was their first technical employee in Ireland at the time and uh, developed their kind of consulting area for them. And then I took a career break. And a lot of my friends who took career breaks at the time were saying, you know, oh, I don't think I'm ever gonna get back to work again. I, I don't know how this is gonna work out. And I think it's a fear a lot of, a lot of women have and it's something that needs to be addressed in the workplace. Um, but I was lucky, I took a few years off and I decided at the end of that to focus in on something that I'd always worked in on the periphery um, and did a master's in cybersecurity and uh, digital forensics. And um, I subsequently went on to lecture as well as doing my day job um, in the course that I did. But um, I think a lot of people find that having taken a career break getting back into the workplace is actually very challenging. And I think this is something that we could support a lot of women better with. And it's, it's there in every career, but it's really noticeable in cybersecurity because we already have such a small population and it means we're really missing role models for people to, to step up to if we don't um, try and encourage this. So I just wanted to tell you about some of the things that I've experienced over the years as, as gender bias. Um, my name, Jackie Fox, because I spell it with a Y. A lot of people who haven't spoken to me think that I'm a man because of the job that I do, so I get a lot of correspondence um, addressed to Mr. Jackie Fox. Um, now, I was fortunate that, as I said earlier, my, my dad was a role model to me. Um, I've seen in school, when I was in school, there are different levels of mathematics that you can sit, and when I was going through school, um, the higher level maths, um, a lot of girls weren't encouraged to do it. They were kind of told, oh, focus on the other subjects. Now, that's changed now, thankfully. It's now 50-50 in Ireland, but it's, it's a short period of time that that's changed over, but I think that's a really positive thing. In my first job, I was asked to wear a skirt to work every day, even though I spent a lot of time actually cabling and kind of soldering things and climbing around networks and drilling holes in walls to get wires and things through. So it was, it was a bit awkward, and I know that wouldn't happen today, but that was the sort of thing that somebody of my era had to go through in order to end up working in this type of area at my age and have the type of experience that I have managed to gain over the years. Um, and uh, along that journey, I did have some quite funny experiences. Um, I went in once to install uh, a network um, for an organization and the man who was purchasing it actually thought that I was a man coming in to do it because of my name. And uh, when I arrived in, he went, uh, you can't do that, I'm sorry. You know, I, I need a man to come in and do, install this network and you know, set up the applications. And I'm sorry, you just can't do it. And uh, I was actually really busy. I'd been double booked for a week anyway. And I, I kind of thought, okay, that doesn't really bother me. So I just rang my boss and said, listen, the guy doesn't want me there because I'm a woman. So um, my boss rang him back and said, it's like this, we either take the whole thing away or she installs it, it's your choice. And so 
he actually said, I need to think about it. Um, and he came to the conclusion that he wasn't going to get this system installed because it was before Christmas and it was a really busy time unless he agreed to have a woman do it for him. So he came back to me and he said, okay, you can do it. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, he sat down and decided, because I was a technical person, that he should try and speak to me about something technical. So he thought that we would have common ground speaking about the aluminium pots and pans and the heat dissipation that he had bought his wife for Christmas. And I was kind of thinking, good luck with that. <laughs> um, I also had an experience once where I went in to install uh, a network in a male-only organization. And um, when I went in, um, they looked at me again at the door and thought, oh dear, this isn't great. And I said, is there a problem? And they said, unfortunately, we don't have a female toilet here. So uh, we don't, you know, you, you, this is going to be an issue, you know. And I said, no, it's okay. And I said, we'll get a sign and we'll put it on the door and we'll work it out. And I discovered as time went on, actually, that they did have a, a, a female toilet, but they had it full of boxes and equipment and they weren't able to move it out because no women ever ventured into the place. Um, so. Th I, I don't actually believe that would happen today, but like, that's not that long ago, like it's 10 years ago. So, you know, these are some of the challenges that women in this area can face. The, um, I also sometimes have great fun with, um, you know, people when I meet them somewhere and they say, what do you do for a living? And, and I, you know, do I look like cybersecurity specialist? Do I look like a forensic investigator? Do I look like someone who might hack into your computer? with people's bias in their head that I, I don't like. So, so playing what's my line with people is actually very amusing for me because nobody who doesn't know me ever guesses what I do for a living. Um, something that I do still see today is um, when I go to an organization and I'm working with them and I might ask a question about, you know, where they're at. Um, for instance, you know, uh, what's your antivirus posture like? And I can get answers like, well, antivirus is something we put on our system because we sometimes get attacked by malware. And I have to kind of step up in the chair, take a deep breath and kind of go, so what do you do like if the signatures of the files don't get updated or I have to hit them back with something that makes them know that I know what I'm talking about. And I, I often feel my male colleagues don't have to do that. So sometimes at the beginning of a meeting, and it's happened to me with male colleagues with me where we've been having an innocent conversation, somebody has said something, and I've hit back with something really strong or very, perhaps very deeply technical. And I can see my colleagues going, why did you do that? But I, I know I have to do it early in a conversation if I can see someone having a gender bias towards me because otherwise we're all wasting our time talking around in circles while they're explaining things politely to me. Um, and the other one that I've been hit with a couple of times is um, that's an unusual job for a woman, which again, I, I find amusing, but this is current. This is happening to people in this space today. So I suppose um, the next thing is how can we influence the future? What, what can we do? Um, to try and uh, adjust this bias. Um, and I think this is more a, a journey. It's not something that's gonna happen overnight. Um, it's something that obviously everyone sitting in the room here has an interest in. Um, I would hope that the, the reason why people might address this is because we're, you know, this is cyber warfare. Like we're, we're fighting things here and we don't really have the, the teams in place, the, the, the optimum team in place to, to fight this. So there are a few things that I've heard female colleagues in this area saying that they think might influence them. This kind of programmer's culture, that in an organization where if you've got 10 people who are working together, one of them happens to be a woman, if it's kind of all this type of culture, it, it can be off-putting for a woman to stay in that environment. So sometimes that might need to be tweaked a little bit. Um, the usage of military lingo um, about weaponized attack, payload, kill chain, can be off-putting for uh, younger women to come into the area. We need to attract more women into IT, full stop. And I, I do think that um, there, are, there is progress being made in some areas with this, but others, no, it's going in the reverse. Um, we need to ensure that gender bias doesn't set in early with uh, children, so that it's a career option that's open to them, that it's in their mind. We need to educate parents, schools, toy makers, that this is a, a valid career choice for females to take. And we need to promote security as being a positive thing rather than um, a prohibition. So 
Um, attracting female talent into cyber. Um, there's some research done by um, a man called Cantor in 1977, which is, I think, slightly related to this about having a tipping point. And if you can't get to 35% of whatever it is that you're trying to change, there's always going to be a, it's going to be a minority. And it doesn't matter whether it's women, whether it's your ethnic minority, wh whatever the, the minority is, unless you can push something to a 35% level, people are always going to view people at the under 35% as being unusual or an oddity or a minority. Um, so this is something that, that we need to do in this area. Um, I've got some other stats there about kind of UCD, the level of female intake, 20% female intake, um, but less than 10% of them actually practice. Um, the reason they state is they drop out of the employment stage because they don't see the career path in it for women, and they also say that there's an imbalance of pay and promotions. Um, I think that cyber is moving into a boardroom rather than a back room, and I think this is something that we can do to try and get this out to women, that the, the business aspect of it, women are good communicators and should be able to tell the story well to people. There are great employment prospects and travel prospects, and um, there's great salaries in this at the moment, and this isn't something that you get reflected back if you're saying to people, what, why would you not do this? Even people who are in IT, why, why would you not move into cyber? They, they don't seem to appreciate the, the benefits that we probably know within this space. It's also really important that the women who are in this area don't pull the ladder up after themselves as they go up and that they, they work in this area. I, I personally make an effort to make sure that our interview panels are balanced. I won't positively discriminate towards a woman in employing, but I will make sure that we maybe are slightly more predisposed to employing or to um, interviewing a female candidate. Uh, female candidates are, are known in all areas of life for looking at a job description and saying, oh, I can only do 50% of that, I'm not going to apply, whereas male candidates will go, yes, I can do 50% of that, I'm so going to apply. And there's a lot of studies around that. So this is something that we often need to reach out a little further or dig a little deeper into some of the female applicants that come into this area. Um, this is something that has been seen around the world, these sort of areas in, you know, it's not just cybersecurity, it's not just IT. Um, the, the Basketball League in the, the US uh, saw this with senior, senior positions and they set up this, not a quota, but just to say that on the way in they would have to interview and panel a certain number of people. Um, setting inclusiveness goals. Women tend to be judged on what they're doing rather than their potential. And again, this is statistically nothing to do with cyber. There's a lot of reports that will detail this. So we need to make sure that in our own organizations that we are not just judging women on what they're doing today, that we're judging them on their potential. And we need to think about this as we're actually going through and looking at career paths for people that might be working around us. In my organization, we've asked women in all areas, um, what is it that would be important for them in a workplace? Um, and they've said things like leadership and mentors, giving opportunities, recognizing female talent and acknowledging it. And it doesn't have to be in cybersecurity. It doesn't have to be in IT. It's just within the organization to see senior female role models around them that they can aspire to. I think retaining women in general, um, the role models is very important. Um, and having non-gender related employer support. And this is about uh, if you have a policy around uh, parenthood, that it's not a maternity leave, that it's a parenthood leave. And that if, it's, if there are policies around supporting family for whatever reason, that these aren't seen to be gender related uh, things that are given to women in an organization because if they get um, viewed as being gender related, it's been seen that women won't actually take up on the options because they don't want to categorize themselves into this female bucket. They, whereas if it's across an organization for both genders, then uh, there is a, a lot better uptake. Um, and it's something that people need at different stages in their life when they're having children, if their parents are elderly and need assistance. 
getting women to return back into work as well is a challenge in a lot of areas, but it's particularly challenging in cyber, um, trying to attract back in mature candidates. And a lot of this is to do with the pace at which the industry moves because it's so young and so immature that you know, the job today and the job in three years' time or the job five years ago are very different. So I think we need to have third level education and employer support so that um, people can actually be supported through that, that it's not something that they're afraid of. And I think people convert very well from IT to cyber. People who've got existing cyber skills, it can be off-putting to come back in thinking of this knowledge gap and how do you come back in to a senior position when people working for you may um, be better than you, know more, have more knowledge than you. So we need to support people through that and recognize some of the things that they might have learned while outside the workplace and just get, get, give them something that will get them back on the bike really quickly. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, the question was around, uh, does a career break kill somebody's IT knowledge because it's so fast moving? And yes and no. Um, I think putting in place accelerated learning for people to come back in, maybe a six month course to, to push because some things don't change. You know, um, the, the bits and bytes bit, the, you know, the you know, moving data from one area to another, there's some things that don't change. The way we do it or the nuances about it might change or the details or the vulnerabilities that we might be coming across change. But the actual technical, the stack, those sort of things, they don't really change. So if somebody has that knowledge, they just need to refresh it and maybe look at some of the, the new things that have come about. Um, also, while somebody is taking a career break, it's a good idea to just keep your keep a little bit involved, maybe in local groups or like while I was taking my career group, I computerized school libraries and I kind of I just help people do bits and pieces and I'm lucky my family are quite involved in IT, so every now and then they pulled me in to help with something. So I managed to keep somewhat up to date, if not completely up to date over the period that I had my career breaks. So I think a combination of the two of those should help people. Anything else? Yes. Um, the question is around anonymizing work samples to take the gender bias out of the selection process. Um, what, what exactly do you mean about work samples? Do you mean about what we present outwards to people or how we... Um, okay, it's, 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 the question is around kind of have we tried changing maybe kind of on the interview process or the code, code review piece on the way in, um, make it gender neutral. Um, uh, no, um, we haven't. Um, I haven't looked at them to see whether there is a gender bias in them. The, uh, um, and I suppose there are always names like Sam and things that are gender neutral that could be used. So I think it would be a good suggestion to make sure that things are gender neutral. I think there's definitely research around the visualization um, that if you're, you know, kind of saying come and work at our place and you're showing a picture of your lab or your um, technologists working together, that if it is a whole load of guys huddled around together, it, it does put women off from applying, definitely. And I think that local code academy um, is proof and point for that for me that when they somebody raised it with them, they changed their, their image and it is having an impact on the, the number of females joining their course, so it's good. I think it does because, and the question is, does it matter that we, uh, you know, does it really matter? Um, 
because I think we're missing out on a lot of very talented people. Um, and I think that there are some countries that you might consider on the other side of our cyber war who um, don't have the same level of gender bias that we have. So I believe that they potentially are pulling from a, uh, a pool that is a little higher up the food chain than we might be. The, uh, so I think when, if you look at it as a war that we're trying to fight, um, we're losing out a lot of top talent in the West by our gender bias. So I, I really believe that. I really believe it does matter. So. Anything else? Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Oh, sorry, there is one. Yep. I agree, totally agree. Yeah, that's very interesting feedback, and I've heard it before. Just um, one of our uh, audience here was saying that uh, her male colleagues, she's one of one in a group of sixty, um, uh, have commented to her that it's a nicer place to be when she's there. Which I'm sure, you know, wh what they're meaning is that they're behavior towards each other is better when there's a, a, a female in, in the company. So, thank you. Okay, thanks very much everyone.